I'm so happy that you are here. You guys can have a seat. I'm so happy that you guys are here this morning. And, and I just, you know, first service, um, I just felt like the Holy Spirit say one thing. That you're here for a reason. Sometimes you come into church and you think, I'm just here because I go to church. Or I'm just here because I came with my mom. Or I'm just here because, you know, someone drove me. Or it's the right thing to do. Or it's a box I check. Or something like that. But can I just tell you, this morning, you are here for a reason. Because I believe God has a word for you that's going to actually set you free and enable you to take a step forward this morning from where you are currently seated today. And that is what is so great about the Holy Spirit is he's constantly moving on our behalf. We think it's us. We think, oh, well, I came to church today. Oh, no. You came to church because the Holy Spirit was like, come on now. Let's go. Let's get to church. We got, I got something for you. I got something to change in your spirit. So this morning on Mother's Day, uh, I'm calling my message. Oh, my name's Dana, by the way, in case you don't know who I am. I'm married to Maloof. But um, I entitled my message this morning, A Pep Talk from Your Mom, figuring out what you were created to do. Because who knows, everybody in their life needs a pep talk from their mom. My mom... Happy Mother's Day, Mimi, all the way in L.A. My mom was the best mom. She gave me so many pep talks in life, and she told me I could do it. I mean, this is how much she told me I could do it. I literally thought I was a princess. And one day, she tried to inform me that I wasn't, and I was like, oh, no. You have been telling me my whole life this is what I am. You think in one day you can tell me I'm not? Like, no, no, that's not the way it works in life. But listen, I'm giving you a pep talk today, and I'm believing that God has something for you. Do you know that you are unique? Do you know that you're special? Do you know that there is no one else on the planet that is exactly like you? Do you know that God has gifted you with so many things on the inside that are so different than me? But because he has a people group for you to reach, do you know that you can do nothing to separate you from the love of God? Do you know that no past sin, no past mistake can keep you from this Jesus that is for you this morning? Do you know he champions your every move? Do you know that he's sitting in heaven saying, that is my kid. I have two kids of my own and I know my heart bursts. Actually, like sometimes I feel like it's going to come out of my chest because I'm so proud. Even when they do dumb things, I think, oh my God, that's still my kid. <laughs> that dumb thing was so precious. We'll have to talk about it later, but it was precious in the moment. You know, that's how God looks at us. He's like, come on. So this morning, I'm going to give you a little pep talk, but I'm going to give you a pep talk with some practical things in it because one thing about me is I love to cheerlead people, but um, I am super, super practical also. So this morning, we're going to go on that journey on what was I created to do? And I'm hoping by the time we're done with this little brief moments together, you're going to walk away with some next steps that you can take and go like, God, we can do this. I know we can do this. Uh, I'm, we're going to start out with Ephesians 2.10. It says, for we are God's masterpiece. He was, uh, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us a long time ago to do. Do you realize you are his masterpiece? That's what I love about the Bible. It is just tells you exactly what you are. There's no guessing game in there. <laughs> he says, hello, you're my masterpiece. I created you to do this. Now let's go and do this. Don't you love that? I love that. And I love how the Holy Spirit comes alongside and partners with it and says, and here's how we're going to do it. I'm going to give you a pep talk. I'm going to comfort you. I'm going to give you wisdom along the way. I was laughing earlier because PC was telling about uh, last week, he was saying, you know, the, the Holy Spirit, we're in a series about the Holy Spirit. And he was saying how the Holy Spirit is a comforter and, you know, like um, comes and gives wisdom, kind of like a mother. And I was thinking to myself, ooh, I took one of those, you know, tests that give your personality type thingy-mabobs in it. And, and 
and your your spiritual giftings or whatever. And I was thinking to myself, Ooh, eh. um, uh, when it said mercy, I was like a negative 15. I'm like, I really need the Holy Spirit. I really need the Holy Spirit because if the, if the Holy Spirit is an encourager and a mother and loves to come in, I'm like, I need the Holy Spirit in my life today. But the great news is we are God's masterpiece. So here's the deal, is you don't have to have it all together. Aren't you excited? I tell you, that's the best news in my life, is you don't have to have it all together. Do you know in 1 Corinthians 2, 12, 14, it says there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit is at the source of them all. Guys, I don't have to look like you. You don't have to look like me. Do you, do you see what the Bible says? There are different kinds of spiritual gifts. But the whole, the spirit, he's one spirit. And he is the source of them all. So sometimes in life, I think we think, oh, well, their spiritual gift is elevated over here. Because do you see all the amazing things that are happening? Or, oh, my goodness, if I could only... If I could only do these things. No, no, no. The Bible says there are different kinds of spiritual gifts. So guess what? Yeah, some people are going to do better at that than you. Some people are going to do better at that than you. I'll never forget. My kids used to always be like, I'm the best at this. I'm the best at this. And me being the practical mom, I was like, um, can I just correct that? There's like a thousand other people who are going to be better than, than you at that. And they're like, oh, mom. I'm like, yeah, can't be that American Idol mom. There's absolutely going to be people who are better than you. But you get to walk out your best life. So what is the spiritual gift that God has put in you? And here's the great thing is that the spirit is the source of them all. So as I was thinking about this whole pep talk from your mom, being who you were created to be, um, actually, I was driving to L.A. to visit our daughter Emma about three months ago. And I was driving in the car and it's like a 22-hour drive. And the Lord just dropped this message into my heart. And I was like, he's like, this, this is your next message you're, you're going to preach on. And so, you know, I can't like type everything they say. And so I'm trying to voice text as I'm driving and follow the directions, the multitasking. And I get through and, and now I'm going to study for my message. And I go back and look at everything. And you know, when you voice text, it's all mumble jumbled. And you're like, what was it exactly I was trying to tell myself in that moment? But basically, as I was going through everything, I realized, okay, who in the Bible could we look at this morning who had a calling on their life, maybe it looked different than everyone else, maybe it didn't go according to plan like everyone else, but he had something unique in his life. And I was actually talking to Pastor Daniel because I had a whole bunch of examples and we were talking through the message and he's like, what about David? David, the most unlikely. I was like, ooh, that's good, I'm going to steal that. So this morning, I'm going to tell you a quick story about David. So David... He was this shepherd, and um, he was one of 12 brothers. Maybe you've heard the story, maybe you haven't, but uh, he was one of 12 brothers, and he was tending the flock and the sheep, and he was out there. He was young and dirty and doing all this stuff, and, and Samuel was a prophet during the time, and he said, I'm going to come. The Lord said, I need you to go anoint the next king because Saul was going to be transitioning out, and so Samuel was like, who is it, Lord? And he said, I want you to go to this house over here and then anoint the king. So he takes this little trip to this town, calls the family up and says, okay, where's your sons? Bring them. And the first son comes up and he is this amazing person. I mean, the Bible describes him. He's good looking. He's tall. He's like firstborn. And if you know anything about during that time and era, the firstborn was like everything. If you were a firstborn son, you pretty much had your way made in life. And so uh, Samuel looks at him and he's like, oh, of course you're it. Look at you. You're like the Instagram gods that people look at. You're like, come on now, right? And Samuel looks at him and God says, no, that's not it. And he's like, wait, I don't think, God, could you just relook?" 
really at what I'm standing next to because I don't think you're seeing what I'm seeing. What I'm seeing with my natural eye is the obvious choice. And God is looking at, the, at this man and he's like, nope, sorry, that's not it. So Samuel goes down to the next in line and he's like, all right, number two. We, we got to be winning with number two. God says, nope. Third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh. We go all the way down the line. And finally he's like, do you have any more kids? Like, maybe I had the wrong family. He's like, so sorry. I got your hopes up. You thought you were going to be king, someone in here. But I guess it's a different family, right? So he's like, and they're like, oh, well, actually we do. We have one more. I have one more son, but he's out in the fields. <laughs> Have you ever stopped to think about out in the fields, what that actually means? I was thinking about it the other day, and for me, like, when my son is, like, at the park, I just do hit find a phone, and it pings his phone, and then he calls me back. Out in the fields in those days means, like, maybe somewhere out in the southwest far, you know, corner of the pasture, and it's, like, days to get there. So they're going to go get David, and they're like, uh, hold on, we'll be back. Can you wait a week? you know, we'll be right back. I'm just going to, I just have to go get on my horse, pack my food, make my food, kill the animal that I'm going to bring with me. Oh, and then I got to take the cheese and, oh, hold on. I got to bake the bread first. And then I'm going to finally get on the horse and then I'm going to go get David. And then we're going to take a whole week and come all the way back. That's what, there was no like flyover drone where you could like spot where he was. Nothing like that. So it was effort to go and get David. So all of a sudden, David comes back, and he's, he's now there, and, and Samuel's looking at him, and he's like, I mean, if I, if I were Samuel, I'd be like, oh, God, please, I'm going to look like a fool. If this is not it, I, 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 don't, I, I think I miss you. And David walks on the scene, and God was like, I don't look at the outward appearance. I look at the heart. And in that moment, Samuel was like, oop. I anoint you king, the oil, yada, yada, you're going to be king, and they're off. Well, in my life, I think, oh, my gosh, you're going to be king. But here's what actually happened. He got anointed king, and then he went back out to being a shepherd. He took care of the animals, the sinkiness. We learn in the Bible that he killed and, and fought the bears and, and the lions and kept the animals safe. And then we come to find out as we go along that Israel went to war and his brothers were at war and he became the Uber driver because he had to go get the food for his brother. So Uber Eats called him up and he said, hi, I'd like to order some cheese and some bread for you to bring out to the war. And David's like already way off here and he's like, okay, dad, you know, loads the stuff and he goes off to the war to find his brothers to literally just serve them and bring them food. Keep in mind, he was anointed king. So he's there, he's dropping it off, and all of a sudden he's like hearing all these crazy things. He's like, wait, is someone yelling? Who's, who is yelling at the Israelites? Who is taunting the Israelites? And he, I can just picture, he's peeking out of the tent where he's just delivered the food. And he's like, who is that guy? This is what I love about David. In that moment, he was like, blank, no. H double -E L hockey sticks, however it goes. <laughs> Hell no. There is not this person that's going to come and taunt the Israelites. I was anointed king. Why isn't the king doing something about it? And all of a sudden, David starts talking this way, and his brothers are like, be quiet. Don't say anything. This isn't your place. You're just here to bring us food. Don't say anything. Be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. Well, the king gets word of it, and the king calls in David, and he says, I hear you want to fight Goliath. And David's like, yeah. What is he? God against the armies of Israel. And so Saul's like, well, if you're going to do it, here, let's put on this armor. Put on my armor. So David puts on Saul's armor all of this battle stuff. And David's standing there and he's like, um, this really isn't going to work for me. You know, I, w I wasn't created to wear this. And he took the whole thing off and he's like, I was created to wear this. I just wear my little shepherd robe and I fight my battles with these five little stones and I'm just going to fling them in the air and it's going to nail them in the head and Goliath is going to fall down. 
He's like, I was anointed king. That's who God created me to be. So he goes out, he does that. And then here's the crazy thing. They all celebrate David. Goliath is dead. He's chopped off his head. He gets to marry the king's daughter. He becomes best friend with the king's son. And then the cherry on the top for him is for the next 15 years, Saul tries to kill him. Isn't that awesome? (laughs) You do this amazing thing, and then the person that you're serving tries to kill you for 15 years. It was 15 years that David walked the journey before he was actually king, living in the palace, walking out what God had called him to do. So this morning, as we're thinking about what am I created to do, I just am going to take you on a little journey because sometimes when we think we're created to do one thing, we disqualify ourselves. We say, I'm too young. I can't do that. I don't have enough experience. I don't know what I'm doing. There's so many other people who are more qualified than me. Uh, I'm too old. I've already lived half my life. What am I going to do right now? What am I going to invest right now? I, I, I might as well just support the next generation that's coming up. Maybe you're a grandma or a grandpa and you're like, no, I am really too old. I have lived all my life and now I'm, I, I have no energy to start something new. But here's the deal. is the journey is part of what we were created to do when we walk out what God has created us to do. It's the journey in life. It's the journey that David took all those years before he actually walked out becoming king. So this morning, we're going to get right down to the nitty-gritty tax, the really practical things that you need to do in your life to walk out what you are created to do. Number one, you have to establish this first thing. Whose am I? Ephesians 2.10 says again, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. You have to know who you are. What is your identity in Christ? This is what I love about the Bible. It It just told you. Isn't this great? You never have to wonder this again. Right here, you just pull up Ephesians 2.10 and you're like, self, I am God's masterpiece. And that was planned a long time ago for me to do great things. That's who I am. That's my identity in Christ. That's who Jesus says I am. So I can do whatever it is that he has created me to do. I've settled that first and foremost. I'm not going to listen to the lies of the enemy any longer. I'm not going to listen to what the enemy is trying to tell my mind that I'm a failure, that I don't measure up, that I don't look like this person over here, I don't act like this person over here, that my laundry room isn't perfect. Perfect with all the baskets and everything like this. I love Candace. Candace sends me pictures, the most beautiful Instagram pictures I've ever seen in my whole life of houses that are decorated. I mean, the glow and the everything on it. And I think, in my dreams, I'm wishing my life actually looked like that. But in reality, like you go to my house this morning, you have to step over the laundry that I was folding on the floor in the living room last night, right? And the protein powders are out on the counter. And the dishes are piled high in the sink. Just welcome to my house. I'm making everybody feel good this morning. (laughs) My life is not an Instagram picture, even though I wish it was as beautiful as the things that Candace sent me. I dream about that. I think, oh, my God. But God called me to be a king or a queen. And maybe my king or queen looking doesn't happen to look like the Instagram picture. Maybe it happens to look like something else. But I've had to establish whose I was. I am Christ and my identity is found in him. Thank God we are his masterpiece. David could not wear Saul's armor. He had to realize that's not who God created me to be. I'm a different kind of warrior. I'm one that actually fights with little stones, not with a giant sword. Isn't that beautiful? You don't have to be like your neighbor. Okay, number two, once you've established that, now you can ask yourself, what was I created to do? 
Let me give you Jeremiah 1.5. It says, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. I love the Bible. Guys, my brain, I can't even, I wish you could live inside my brain. I think very practically. This is the best thing. I should actually preach on Father's Day, connect with y'all. The practical reasons. And Maloof, my husband, he should actually be preaching on Mother's Day because his brain thinks way more emotional based and everything like that. And that's the beauty of it, yes. What was I created for? But I love the Bible because it's practical. He says, I knew you before I formed you. So not only did he know us, we're informed that he, uh, we were also formed, he formed us, and then we are also told that, okay, now I set you apart and appointed you to prophets, as prophets to the nations. We each are set apart as prophets to the nations. My calling and your calling are completely different, but we are all part of the same calling, which pushes us towards people. Do you see in the Bible, Esther was different than Ruth. Moses was different than David. Do you know in the Old Testament, God provided a whole string of judges before Saul became the first king. Every judge was different. Because they needed a different skill set for that moment in time in which God had created them to walk and live on the earth. That's the beauty about figuring out what you were created for. But if you haven't established whose you are, you're never going to get to point two and establish what am I created for. You know, I do, like you said, I have two kids. Emma, she's 18, and she lives in L.A., and then I have, we have a son. I say I because it's Mother's Day. I get to. It's actually we, but, you know. I have another son. His name is Jack here on the front, and he's 15. And when God um, gave us Emma, I mean, that child knew what she was destined for from the moment she was born. I, I tell you, she came out of the womb, like, in one direction, and has never, when I say never, I mean never, never changed trajectories in her entire life. I'm like, what kind of kid are you? Like, at least like have some, like, do you not think about anything else? But she's like, this is what God calls me to do. This is where I'm at. So right now at 18, at 15, she moved to LA because of the calling of God on her life. And right now she's in an Emmy acclaimed award show filming in LA leading people to Jesus in her calling in life right and so here I have this one kid who is so driven driven this is where I'm going and then I have my Jack and when Jack was born we looked at Jack and we just knew he was going to be a leader of leaders and we were like, I wonder what that's going to look like. But in my brain, my, I had already had Emma, so I was like trying to make him fit into Emma's shoes. And so I would ask him, son, is there anything you're passionate about? You know, mommy and daddy got behind Emma, and, and we wanted to champion her. And is there anything like in your heart you're just passionate about and, and we could champion and I love him because he looks at me, he goes, mm, nope, not really, mom. I just really love my friends and people right now. And it dawned on me, oh my gosh, that's because you're walking out your calling. He told me the other day, he goes, yeah, mom, I'm making friends with this new guy. He, he's had a little trouble in his life and gotten, you know, not into some great things. But, but uh, you know, when he's with me, he doesn't have to act that way. I think it's the first time in his life he can really just be himself. And we just laugh and have a good time. And I'm like, Jack, you need to invite him to church. Come on, let's get him saved. You know, invite him to church. And he looks at me, he goes, Mom, Mom, it's a different journey. I'm starting with relationship first. And I was like, oh, my gosh. My 15-year-old is schooling me right now. Yes, son, start with relationship. Don't be me. Don't try to push it and mold it and make it into something. And that's what I love about knowing who you were created to be. He knows he was not created to be his sister, and his sister knows she was not created to be him. Jack tries everything new under the sun. Varsity softball or varsity baseball? Yeah, not softball. Varsity, varsity baseball? I've never played 
Baseball in my life? Yeah, I'll try out. Oh, football on a 5A school? Sure, I've never played football in my life. I'll try out. Oh, wrestling? Sure, I'll try that. That's what I love. Do you see? When you know who you are, you're not worried about what other people are thinking about you. If you're going to mess up or slow down or change directions, you're just willing to walk out what God has called you to do. David was the same way. He was like, who defies the armies of Israel? I was anointed king. Let's get this party started. And as we move forward from there, the last thing, the last step, you need to ask yourself, what is my next step? And here again, the Bible, Matthew 6, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. You don't have to have it all figured out. You don't have to know the beginning from the end. He just says, seek me. And guess what? I will already give you everything that you need. Romans eleven twenty nine says the gifts and his call can never be withdrawn. It's irrevocable. So those things in which God told you when maybe you were younger, that you've hidden away and maybe you've made tons of excuses for yourself and you've said, ah, no, I can't do it. I, I'm, I'm too old. I, I haven't gotten there. There's too many things in my way. I disqualify myself. Do you know his callings are irrevocable? They cannot be withdrawn in your life. I did this really quick thing with our staff, and that's what the papers are on your chair. With our, the staff girls came to my house for lunch, and I asked them. They come once a month, and we were sitting there, and I said, what is one thing you have hidden in your heart that you've never taken a step forward towards, but you know God's asked you to do it? Do you know I had like, 16 to 18 girls there. Everybody said something different. I was like, girls, do you realize the tidal wave of people we could bring along this journey if all of us did all of these individual things? It's not just dependent on one person on a stage in a building with four walls trying to point people to Jesus. It's a collective group. It's a collective effort of people linking arms saying, I'm going to champion you while you champion me so we can see and walk out what God has created us for. That's the beautiful thing about what God does. But he doesn't just stop there. He wants us to take a next practical step. So everybody get out that piece of paper. You're going to get out that piece of paper. Your next practical step, you need to write down what it is in your life that God has asked you to do that maybe you've never told someone. And then right after it, you're going to write the next practical step. What is the one thing I'm going to do? Maybe it's calling someone and saying, hey, how do I get to here? Maybe it's looking something up on a website that you know has a tool for you to get to your next place. It doesn't have to be enormous like parting the Red Sea. It can be like Ruth in the Bible who just supported Naomi supported her mother-in-law and ended up being in the lineage of Jesus. You never know what your calling is going to open the door for, not only in your life, but other people's life. So can I just tell you as a pep talk from your mom this morning, you can do it. There's no one like you those things you have hidden in your hearts, God's going to watch them fulfilled. And this just isn't about the moms or the women. This is about the men. This is about PC writing your book. This is about Maloof. You got children's books. Whew. This is about your businesses that I know you have extra in you. This is about, Candace, those things that I know God put in your heart when you were little. Do not disqualify yourself. Do not disqualify yourself because God has something so much more. So don't let the pain of the past dictate your future because his calling is irrevocable in your life. Church, I love you. 
I tell you, I'm giving you the biggest mom hug on the planet today. I'm so excited for you. Can we just give all of our moms just one more big hand?